And I'm beyond honored and excited to be presenting to you all today. During my presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my journey, my background, as well as research tied to balance and postural control. I'll also express my vision tied to building new biomedical engineering research and educational infrastructure. So my journey actually started long before I was even born. On my father's side, my grandmother was born in Japan and my grandfather was actually born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He dropped out of high school to join the Air Force and met my grandmother in Japan while he was based there during the Korean War. Um, later, they had my father and then moved back to the United States where my grandfather who was an airplane mechanic for several decades for TWA. And my grandmother was a housewife and raised four kids. On my mother's side, my grandparents are from the Philippines. My mother was born in Manila and she had seven siblings. So together they had eight kids. Um, so when my mother was a teenager, her family moved to Brooklyn, New York. My grandmother, an elementary school teacher and my grandfather was an army nurse. So both families didn't come from a lot of wealth, but they understood the meaning of having an education, serving others, and also the idea behind building the American dream. My parents met while they were at Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute in New York. Uh, they were both pursuing their electrical engineering degrees. And I believe they met in a controls theory class. Uh, soon after they were married, and then they had me actually when my dad was pursuing his PhD at MIT. He was the first within his immediate family to get his bachelor's degree, but his siblings you know, followed after. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, and I grew up for the most part on the border of New Hampshire and Massachusetts in a city called Nashua. I spent a lot of my time outdoors as a young child, uh, building forts, playing in the woods, going on bicycle rides. And also with my parents, they were very, uh, hands-on and that my siblings and I have a brother and I also have a sister would help fix things around the house and do chores. Um, and it was very hands-on. There was always something to do. So my earliest memory of being interested in health and medicine was when I was about seven years old. There was a dead mouse in our backyard and there was no clear indication why it had died. My uncle, who's a surgeon, had given me a dissection kit. And so I decided that I was going to dissect the mouse. Um, and my parents, especially my father, really encouraged that type of curiosity. I wanted to know why. Um, and that's my earliest memory of being really curious about health and medicine. So, I think this started probably with my grandfather then was passed on to my father. But I remember my sister, when we were younger, she would build these model airplanes and model cars um, with my father. And I remember thinking that was really neat. And so when I was elementary school age, I also got involved with that, um, you know, building the model airplanes, but then painting them and also placing the decals. And so I think that that type of tinkering and hands-on activity was very, as I said, neat. I remember thinking exactly that word, um, but it also taught me how things can be built and put together, which I thought was very useful. I had a lot of hobbies or extracurriculars. So when I was, I wanna say when I was six or seven years old, I started taking piano lessons and I played piano up through, I'd say grad school. Uh, I don't play actively anymore because I'm incredibly busy but I used to play piano and I practiced two to three hours a day. Uh, I was also part of a drum and bugle corps. Uh, so when I was a high school, when I was a high school kid, um, we were the two time division two world champions and one time silver, silver medalists. I also was interested in sports. So in high school, I did a little bit of track like middle distance track. I also did a little bit of basketball, but I'd have to say my main sport um, that I accelerated in mostly college through grad school was rowing. 
And so these are just some pictures of me competing in various races. One is in Canada, another is head of the Charles in Boston, which is a really big event. So uh, these are some pictures. And actually, my mom was visiting me last week, and she brought uh, a couple stacks of just drawings that I had done when I was younger. And so I was really creative, I think, when I was a little girl. I was really interested in drawing, art, building. And so these are some things that I drew from, I want to say, high school age to maybe early college. Um, so what does the, all this have to do with engineering? And what does it have to do with me now? So the idea of um, the idea of understanding why, being able to build and create, um, persevering, working towards a vision, winning, uh, but also being able to be creative and have new ideas. And this is what I gained from all these various activities, as well as being exposed to different types of people, right? So I like this quote by Thoreau, if you've built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That's where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. So now I'm gonna overview a little bit of my background. So I obtained my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Massachusetts. I then went on to pursue my master's degree at Stanford University in aeroastro engineering. And I worked for about two and a half years at the Charles Dart Draper Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts, before going on to pursue my PhD in the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. I went on to pursue my PhD because I ultimately wanted to work in academia and be a faculty. Um, very soon after I finished my PhD, literally, <laughs> I'll explain in a few slides. I began working at the University of the District of Columbia as an assistant professor, um, given the opportunity to start a new biomedical engineering program, but also start a new research laboratory from scratch. And to date, I'm the associate professor of mechanical engineering and the founding director of the biomedical engineering program, as well as the Center for Biomechanical and Rehabilitation Engineering Laboratory, which I'll discuss in a few slides. So how do I get interested in balance and postural control? Well, as you saw a couple slides back, I was really interested in sports and it always intrigued me how um, you know, people moved in human movement, but also how systems and things work together. So in order to balance, you have these three main sensory systems. So you have the vestibular system, which has to do with your inner ear. So the vestibular system is responsible for sensing equilibrium that you need in order to balance. The somatosensory system, which has to do with touch. So, for example, touch to a support surface, touch to a tabletop, or even the information you're receiving standing on the floor from your feet. There's also uh, visual information that comes from your eyes. So, um, for example, receiving more cues if, if something is lit up versus if there's dim lighting, receiving fewer visual cues. So, all of these. Uh, inputs from the sensory systems come together so that you can elicit an output posture response and maintain your balance. So 90 million Americans suffer from vertigo, dizziness, or some sort of balance problems. Granted, those are not all derived from vestibular dys dysfunction, but it's a widespread issue in terms of balance, dizziness, vertigo. People that have vestibular loss can have a lot of impairments. So just like people can have hearing loss, people can have also severe vestibular loss. And so what happens when someone has severe vestibular loss is a few different, well, multiple different things, but a few different debilitating system, symptoms. So one of them being blurred vision. So for example, this is what it looks like for someone with severe vestibular loss walking down the street. Right, so their eye movements are defective. So um, they experience something called oscillopsia. They also experience dizziness or a spinning sensation, misperception of upright. 
And last but definitely not least, because of these things taken together, they also have balance problems. Um, so you can see that this is a critical issue. Um, so at the Massachusetts Eye and Air Infirmary, they asked a few different questions within the Jenks Vestibular Lab. The research I'm going to describe, the principal investigator was Dr. Lewis, and he's the director of the Jenks Vestibular Lab. So a few different questions we had involved, how do people compensate for different levels of vestibular loss, right? Or different levels of vestibular function, but also can we have a prototype prosthesis that and severely impaired people can restore some of those missing vestibular cues in order to um, you know, bring the eye movements more towards normal and also improve balance? So a lot of you may be familiar with the idea of a cochlear implant. The cochlear implant bypasses the hair cell transduction mechanism and instead provides direct electrical stimulation to the eighth nerve. And that's meant to encode sound, right, in people that have severe hearing loss. So the vestibular prosthesis operates on a very similar principle. Instead, the prosthetic has electrodes which provide electrical stimulation to the functioning eighth nerve so that we can encode angular head velocity. So we can encode how the head is moving. Um, this is a picture of the prosthesis housing, electronics housing that sat atop the animal's head. So the, the research I'm gonna describe in the following slides was done in non-human primates. So our research question was, how does one compensate to maintain balance for various levels of vestibular dysfunction? So looking at animals in a normal state vestibular function through mild, severe, and severe aided by a prototype prosthetic prosthesis, vestibular prosthesis, how, how, does, how does the function affect balance? So as I said, um, the research was done in non-human primates. Uh, this is a video of the animal standing on the balance platform. So here you can see the balance platform, right, with the four foot plates. Each foot plate had tri-directional force sensors, and we could modify the uh, foot plates to be either a hard foam, hard gum surface or a thick compliant foam surface. So why did we do that? So we did that in order to modify the somatosensory information that the animal was receiving from their feet. You also see there's kind of a purplish lighting on the, uh, on the video I'm gonna show you. And that's because all of the experience, experiments were done in dim lighting with black tarp surround to minimize visual information to make the experiment even more challenging. So here is the animal standing on the platform while she's receiving a juice reward. We call this paradigm quiet stance because she's standing stationary uh, or as stationary as she can. And uh, we also do this in people. And there's sensors on the head, or trunk, and also hind trunk to measure trunk position. Another thing to point out is we could vary the stance width between a wide stance and a narrowed stance to make the task either less or more difficult. So this is another paradigm we had where the animal again stood on the balance platform uh, in order to receive juice reward, but instead we had the platform rotating. Uh, so I'll explain this. There may be questions after, but I'll try to just give a brief overview of what it was. So what we had was several uh, frequencies input to the platform at once. There's a white noise approximated stimulus um, that's called the pseudo random ternary sequence. I know that's a mouthful, but just bear with me for a second. So basically, what does a white noise approximated stimulus do? Well, it excites several frequencies at one time simultaneously at nearly equal power. So instead of having one sinusoid and having the platform rotate, you can have multiple at once. So this is advantageous for several reasons. Well, one is that it's unpredictable to the animal. The other is it saves time. 
And then there's another reason, which I'm going to get to in the next slide. Uh, and this is going to go a little bit into some engineering terms, but I'll explain it just briefly. So here's a, actually the animal standing on the moving platform. And you can see it's kind of jittering. And that's because there's multiple frequencies at once being input, as I mentioned. Okay, so in engineering, we have something called the system transfer function. So what is that, even for people that are non-engineers? Well, we have the input to the platform, which we know, as I said, it's the pseudo-random ternary sequence input, which you could just think of as a white noise approximated input. And then we have a measured output. So if we want to relate the input to the output to characterize this rhesus monkey postural control system, we can use the system transfer function to do that. It relates the input to the output. And you'll see why we did that in the next slide when I talk about the model. So now I'm going to spend some time explaining this plot over here. Um, there's the root mean square trunk roll. You can think of it as a trunk deviation in the roll axis. And you have the balanced platform stimulus amplitude on the x-axis. You can see for the normal animal, they have this kind of saturating response as the platform stimulus amplitude increases, the animal saturates its trunk's way in order to prevent it from falling off the platform. Um, this is also seen in normal humans as well. They have this, what we call sway saturation. What happens in people with severe vestibular loss, they don't have that sway saturation and instead they have a linear response and that makes them fall off the platform at the higher stimulus amplitudes. So we wanted to know a couple things. Um, but before I get to that, let me just explain the other results. So we have a mild vestibular loss case with the animal where you see sway saturation, but it's less prevalent. So we had a couple um, hypothesis why this is. Our hypothesis was that the animal was using something called sensory reweighting in order to saturate its sway as the platform stimulus amplitude increases. So what is sensory reweighting? It's the ability of an animal or a person to reweight the different sensory system cues as the task gets more difficult, or in this case, as the platform stimulus amplitude increased. One thing I really wanted to mention is um, for those that don't work with animals, these type of experiments before had only been done in people. They had not been explored in any other um, animals than humans. So it was uh, a challenging set of experiments, but very useful and meaningful in terms of quantifying different levels of vestibular states, but also the prosthesis. So this is a feedback controller model that previously had been only applied in humans, but here we were using it to characterize the responses of the animal. So in particular, we were in, interested in what these two weights were doing. So the perperceptive weight, but also at the top, the graviceptive weight. So what could we do? Well, as I mentioned, the transfer function we had derived from experimental data. We also had a model transfer function using this feedback controller model, we could minimize the error between the two in order to obtain the optimal model parameters. So again, this is like the snapshot because it's a brief, brief talk, but what ultimately did we find? So if you look at these two plots, one showing the graviceptive weight and the other showing the proprioceptive weight as a function of balanced platform stimulus amplitude. For the normal animal, we can see that graviceptive weighting increases with an increase in platform stimulus amplitude, but proprioceptive weighting decreases as a function of platform stimulus amplitude. Um, so the answer is yes, the animal was able to use sensory reweighting 
With the graviceptive weight increase, the animal is orienting more and more with Earth vertical and less so with the tilting support surface as the stimulus amplitude increase. Conversely, the animal is orienting less so with the tilting support surface as the stimulus amplitude increase in the normal state. In the mild vestibular state, we see some characteristics, but not as prevalent in the normal state. So this had to do with how does the animal compensate for different levels of vestibular function? Another research question we had was, can the vestibular prosthesis improve balance in primates with severe vestibular loss? So I'll explain um, this question, but I'll also discuss our hypothesis. So in a normal animal, so a primate or human, they're receiving head and space or vestibular cues. They're also receiving neck proprioceptive information or head on trunk cues. This allows them and us to have an accurate trunk uh, in space estimate. In the severe vestibular loss animal, you're not receiving uh, vestibular information or very limited vestibular information. You still have neck proprioceptive information, but because you're not receiving vestibular information, you have an erroneous trunk response or trunk position estimate. So our question slash hypothesis, well, I'll state the question, then I'll say what we hypothesize. Uh, our question was if you partially restore the missing information um, tied to the vestibular system using a prosthesis, could you restore some of that head and space information or sufficient head and space information that you could integrate with the neck proprioceptive information and have a more accurate trunk position estimate than without the prosthesis. So we hypothesize that using the pros prosthesis in the non-human primates with severe vestibular loss, we would be able to have them um, have a better trunk position estimate, which could be observed as a improved uh, balanceability. So this is the paradigm that we use. You can see the animal is looking at the lights, they'll look straight ahead, and then they'll rotate their head to look at the offset target. So if you remember, I mentioned the prosthesis uh, encoded angular head velocity. The reason this paradigm was important was for two reasons. One is that it's more difficult to balance if you're turning your head. You saw the video of uh, what it looks like for a vestibular loss person walking down the street. But the other is that we wanted to uh, have a strong signal that the prosthesis could encode. So what did we observe? So again, fast forwarding to the results because there were a lot of other layers. But basically, if we look at the peak trunk velocity, and if we also look at the peak trunk displacement, and we compare the severe vestibular loss state, which is the dark gray, to the severe vestibular loss state plus prosthesis, the result shows a decrease both in terms of trunk velocity and also trunk displacement which is an important finding. So that's interpreted as the animal was better able to balance with the prosthesis on than without it. So this has a lot of implications also for, for human studies. So at the time this research was conducted, um, most of the vestibular prosthesis work was looking at the effects of the prosthesis on eye movements. Um, there weren't as many balanced studies and there wasn't a balance study done in terms of looking at the head movements and what that did to balance. Um, so this was you know, a, a unique study in those ways. So uh, now I'm gonna go on and talk a little bit about uh, the work I'm doing at univers the University of the District of Columbia. But first, I'm just gonna kind of give a little bit of backstory. 
Um, so I graduated from the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology in 2013. Uh, I defended my thesis, and then two weeks after defending my thesis in mid-August, I was teaching my first class at UDC, uh, literally two weeks. <laughs> um, and since then have been building the biomedical engineering program and also the CBRE or Center for Biomechanical and Rehabilitation Engineering Lab. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that now. So the University of the District of Columbia is, as you may be aware, a historically black college and university or HBCU. There are about, I wanna say a little over hundred HBCUs nationwide. Um, Aside from being HBCU, the University of the District of Columbia, or commonly known as UDC, is the only public institute of higher education in Washington, D.C. So there's a mission to serve the people of D.C., but also serve, you know, African Americans and ethnic minorities as well. So, um, as I mentioned a couple times, when I joined the university, I was given the opportunity to start a new program as well as start a new lab. And I was a brand new graduate. Uh, so that was both exciting, but also a lot of thought in terms of how to get going. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the biomedical engineering program towards the end of the presentation, but basically, um, you know, there were a few things that happened, and I'll talk mostly about the research side first, because that's what I'm going to talk about in the upcoming slides. So in terms of research, I was given the opportunity to start a new lab. Um, so thinking about grants, how to write grants, uh, how to seek out the resources so that we could have a flourishing laboratory. In terms of the program, thinking about what courses to offer, first getting the program for proposal approved, then the multiple layers, then finally reaching, uh, being able to have a student graduate and getting ABET accreditation, which I'll also talk about. But what I want to talk about now, which has to do with the title of my talk, um, has to do with the research involving the aging population. So the previous research I discussed was all in non-human primates. But the research I'm going to discuss in the upcoming few slides is all done in humans, and in particular, looking at balance in aging individuals. So falls in aging individuals is not just a national problem, it's also a global problem as well. Uh, falls are the second leading cause of unintentional injury um, related deaths worldwide. About one quarter or 25% of people over 65 years old within the United States will suffer a fall. By the year 2030, it's estimated that there'll be seven deadly falls every hour. And the financial burden is estimated to be $101 billion by year 2030 in the US. Also within the past decade, there's been a 59% increase in fall-related deaths. So you see that this is a big issue as uh, the aging population rapidly increases nationwide and also worldwide. So what are some factors that can influence fall risk in aging individuals? Well, one of them is vision, right? So loss of vision, but also, I'm gonna talk about the home environment, but also uh, dimly lit areas as well. So the inability to make use of your vision is a big factor. Neurological issues, or for example, tied to stroke. Uh, general degradation of the systems involved with balance. Medications. So some medications can cause dizziness, which can lead to imbalance. And also home-related factors. So as I mentioned, um, having the right lighting within your home, grab bars, stairs, those can also influence increase or decrease fall risk, um, support surfaces. So having the right surfaces in your home where you can sense information from your feet. So 
So starting from scratch, um, this is actually when I think the lab started looking good, even though uh, some may advise not to show these pictures, but basically uh, when I started the university, it was in the fall of 2013. These pictures were taken in December of 2014, so about a year after I started, and this was very exciting. So it wasn't I moved into a space that already had um, you know, equipment or even the resources there. It had to be built from the bottom up and designed and then and resources sought out so that we could make it flourish. So in, um, in spring of 2014, this is, I wanna say January, 2014, this is what the lab started to look like. And then this is the lab in, I wanna say probably close to summer of 2015. Uh, when the lab started looking good. So I, I misspoke, that was spring 2015 and this was close to the summer of 2015. And these pictures are from winter of 2014. So this is when the lab started looking really good. And I remember being excited and telling my father, who's also a professor that, oh, I have a lab now. And he said, no, you don't have a lab, you have a space. And he was right because <laughs> Uh, you have to be able to do research work in your lab, be able to produce. So my first grant actually came about a year and a half after I joined DDC from the National Science Foundation. And that really helped to kind of build the research infrastructure, but also the biomedical engineering infrastructure as well. And so today we have the Center for Biomechanical and Rehabilitation Engineering Laboratory, or CBRE. Uh, we study human balance and mobility. We have a Vicon motion capture system here to measure body kinematics. We also have a Navigator partial body weight support system, which I'll describe in a couple slides in more details, but that's used to um, basically either unweigh a person's body weight or prevent them from falling where they do exercises. We also have um, an EEG cap to measure electric brain activity, an open bionics robotic hand, and we have a force plate walkway that we use to measure standing balance and gait. And lastly, we have surface ENG to measure electric muscle activity. And we have a lot of activities in the lab. So uh, aside from research, we also have courses that are taught in the lab. We've had numerous outreach activities, including summer workshops for various demographics of students. So high school, community college, undergraduate, and even graduate students have been included. Uh, and then we have a flourishing guest lecture series that still continues to date. That was actually initiated by that first grant that came in 2015 and just kind of stuck with us uh, because it was a good thing to have. So we've had over 75 guest speakers since fall of 2015. Uh, present in lab. Presently, they're presenting virtually, but this term we might have kind of a hybrid model. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the training that happens in the lab. Uh, so sensory and robotic balance training. So what do I mean by sensory training? So if you recall from a few slides back, I showed that there were various sensory systems involved in maintaining your balance. So what we do in terms of training is we have various compliance of foam. So uh, moderate compliant foam and also like uh, very compliant foam that the person stands or walks on so we can train that sensory system. We also try to provide or eliminate vision and then um, do various exercises with the people. The Navigator Partial Body Weight Support System is a robotic system that allows the person to walk in multiple directions uh, while preventing them from falling. And also you can weigh a fraction of their body weight while they do exercises. So this device is one of two that exists nationwide. The other is at Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine. And this was designed by our Dean of School of Engineering, Dean Shetty. And we use this to study balance in older individuals that are healthy, as well as older individuals that have suffered stroke. So we have various studies that have been done on the lab. 
uh, with able-bodied people as well as impaired individuals, but I'm just going to highlight one because we don't have a lot of time today. I'm just going to highlight one that has to do again with the aging balance. So this study was sponsored by the National Science Foundation, and it has to do with investigating a new generation of assistive innovative technologies for balance rehabilitation. This was a research initiation award by HBCU UP, which really helped towards getting other grants, which came after, um, and initiating this type of research that was done in the lab. So for participants, we looked at people that were 65 to 80 years old. We had about 40 people that we studied in the lab over several weeks. So we had a healthy group of 30 participants and a group of eight participants that were at least six months post-stroke. For training, we worked with the participants two sessions a week for six weeks. But we also did, um, aside from the training, pre, intermediate, and post assessments. I'll describe the assessments in a moment. Uh, for the training, we did a combination of standing and walking exercises. As I mentioned, different compliance of foam um, was also part of the training where they would stand or walk, isolated leg exercises, and also maneuvering over obstacles. In terms of assessments, we initially did a mini mental state examination. I can't reach all the way up there, um, where we wanted to basically determine if the person had sufficient cognitive ability to participate in the study. We also have something called the balance error scoring assessment or test. Um, so if I go back to the previous slide, here's someone doing the best assessment. So a person can stand on a hard surface or the foam surface in a wide stance, tandem leg stance, or a single leg stance with their eyes closed. And basically we count how many deviations they have from upright in a 20 second trial. And we do that, I wanna say three times um, per, three times per, uh, per condition. So if they have deviations from upright, that means that counts as an error. So we call that a best error. The activity specific balance confidence scale um, has to do with something called balance confidence, which is tied to fear of falling. So what is balance confidence? Well, um, you could be 100% confident that you'll not lose your balance doing a certain activity, or you could be 0% confident. So what do I mean by that? In this survey assessment, we ask people, how confident are you, for example, walking on icy sidewalks? And a participant could say, I'm 0% confident that I won't lose my balance, or they could say, I'm 100% confident that I can maintain my balance. So it's a way of getting an idea of how confident they are doing various tasks. In this case, activities specific balance confidence has activities that are done in and out of the home and that allows us to gauge their confidence in comparison to their balance ability, which is something different. We also use assessments tied to the force plate um, to measure balance and gait. And lastly, we looked at motion capture data as well. So this is just showing, it's delayed for a second, but this is just showing an example of a participant working with us in the lab. As you can see, the foam is very, actually very difficult to balance on because you're not getting enough information from your feet. And here we're equipping the participant with a navigator. So the students are heavily involved with um, the training, the acquisition of the data, but also in uh, writing up the papers, uh, we, especially the undergraduate students, we nurture them and teach them the process of doing research and then carrying out to go into conferences and or writing paper publications. So I'm just gonna briefly overview a subset of the findings, um, but basically this is looking at the best errors as a function of best condition. So as you move to the right, the best condition uh, difficulty is gonna increase. And you can see the best errors on the y-axis. So looking at 
healthy individuals, but also individuals that had suffered stroke. So for both populations, you can see that with training, there was a decrease in the best errors for each condition, for many of the conditions. Um, and that was interpreted as a better ability to balance after the training compared to pre. So this slide gets into something that's tied to balance confidence. So believe it or not, people that have not even fallen before but are aging have a fear of falling. Initially, you might think that just people that have a fear of falling have fallen before, not necessarily. Um, sometimes people can sense that their balance is degrading and they become, can become very afraid uh, to do certain activities and that affects their balance confidence. So this plot just shows um, stroke individuals balance confidence pre and post at the, as the circles and then the squares uh, are healthy individuals pre and post training. So there wasn't a difference pre and post training for the different populations, but as you can see, the balance confidence is decreased for the stroke population, which is what we would expect. Um, but this is showing something different. So we have the activity specific balance confidence as a function of total best error. So our, we have a different question here, which is, um, you know, how does balance confidence relate to balance ability? Are they related? And so for the healthy individuals, we can see that if there's an increase in balance confidence, there's also a decrease in the total best error. But, sorry, but um, on this plot, we don't see a relationship between the balance confidence and the number of best errors. So someone could have a good balance ability, but still be not confident. So why is that? Um, there may need to be an extra layer of training, where I don't wanna say a psychologist is involved, but there's also something that happens that's real, very real, like I said, fear of falling, uh, where there might not need to be an extra layer of um, training there. The other thing is the study was several weeks, but the person might not have been able to experience some of those situations that are in the activity specific balance confidence survey. So they couldn't really gauge if their balance ability had improved, even though it had in terms of the metrics within the lab. So aging population is definitely a focus area with our research, as well as survivors of stroke. Amputees, which affects um, several million uh, Americans nationwide with veterans and children being the leading recipients for prosthetics. These are all groups that I hope to target. And so I'm gonna to try to move along because I know that we wanna get questions as well. Uh, but one thing I'm currently working on is designing and building a specialized distinctive and modernized technological center for assistive rehabilitation research. Um, this is sponsored by the National Institutes of Health to construct this new center here at the University of the District of Columbia. There are several focus areas, so one of them being biomechanics, uh, in particular bioimaging as well as advanced manufacturing, uh, virtual reality rehabilitation, assistive technologies in medical robotics, and gait and balance, which is the current focus of the CBRE lab, and then having spaces where the researchers can work, but also bringing together UDC is part of a consortium of 17 universities in the Metro DC area, bringing those schools together, but also nationally bringing together researchers as well to do cutting edge research that will help these various individuals that need it. Um, on the left-hand side, it's just showing some of the types of equipment that will be in these new labs. And so that's something I'm currently diligently working on uh, as a principal investigator of this project. So UDC Biomedical Engineering, this could be a whole talk within itself, which I'm not going to do, but just briefly talking about the Biomedical Engineering Program. I joined in fall of 2013. Uh, the Biomedical Engineering proposal internally was full board approved in fall of 2014. Department of Education approval came in 2017, first 
biomedical engineering graduate in summer of 20. And then we had our first ABET accreditation visit in uh, fall of 2020 during the pandemic. But it proved fruitful in that we became the first ABET accredited Bachelor of Science in Biomedical Engineering program at an HBCU. So there are other programs out there that are bioengineering or different title, but biomedical engineering means something distinct to us because it ties in the idea of um, merging engineering with medicine in the clinic. Uh, so as the program director, there were a lot of layers in terms of teaching new courses, spearheading new courses, of course, getting the funding has been a thing. So it sounds surprising, but it's actually true <laughs> that I've had direct influence on 20 courses while at UDC. So eight of those were new courses that were offered to the demographic of engineering students at UDC. And then the other courses were courses I helped spearhead that my colleagues now, colleagues now teach uh, in terms of uh, writing the syllabus, getting the course inventory and all that. So it's been a lot of work, um, but we're so proud to have this program and you know, would like to see it grow as things progress. So these are just a few pictures um, tied to the biomedical engineering program. I know we're cutting it closer on time. I wanna leave enough time for questions, but just showing the various student activities um, definitely integrating research with education is a big, um, is a major component, I would say, of the program, not just for myself, but for my colleagues as well. We always try to integrate the undergraduate students in our research and get them involved. Okay, so lessons learned. Um, so if I wanted to import, I, if I want to convey one important idea to students, new faculty, new professionals is to take risks and don't be afraid of things not working. Uh, know that it may take some time and it might take a lot of tries, but if you really have a vision that you should go for it, um, but take calculated risks at the same time. In terms of diversity in STEM, I would say um, if you're the only one that looks if you're the only one that looks like you in the room, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't belong there. It could mean that you are bringing something unique to the table and your knowledge or experiences are valued and are useful. So don't feel uh, that if you, you bring something different that that's a bad thing, that could be a very good thing. The other thing is, um, you know, whatever hurdles you face, you can do it. So I'm a mom. Uh, I have, a, he's going to be a three-year-old son at the end of the month, but I'm also six months pregnant right now. And so uh, one barrier that I think, not all, but some women may face is that they want to have their career, but also they want to be successful professionally as well. And you can very much do that. Um, you might just have to do things maybe a little bit differently or work a little bit harder in some ways or get a little bit less rest, but you can definitely achieve your goals. And that's not just for females, also for males encountering like various barriers. If you really wanna do something, uh, there are ways you can find a way to do it. You just have to have a strategy and be efficient. Uh, what continues to inspire me? I would say definitely, there are a lot of people that inspire me. But I think uh, my son inspires me. I can definitely say that I've become uh, even more efficient. I was efficient before, but even more 